Hello, today we have a class on critical media theories. I am your professor, Rachel Khan of the UP Journalism Department. Critical theory is a theoretical tradition developed most notably by Max Hochheimer, Theodore Adorno, and later Jorgen Habermas of the Frankfurt School. Their work is influenced by the works of Marx, Kant, Hegel, and Weber. What is critical theory? These are theories that seek to challenge the status quo of communication contexts, looking for alternatives to those forms of oppressive communication. Critical theory is not a theory proper, but a set of complementary theoretical frames that examines structures of domination in society in order to open possibilities for the emancipation of people, meanings, and values. Max Hochheimer defined critical theory in the book Traditional and Critical Theory. In his work, Hochheimer asserted that a critical theory must do two important things. It must account for society within a historical context, and it should seek to offer a robust and holistic critique by incorporating insights from all social sciences. Meanwhile, Adorno stated that communication is a fundamental symbolic production process in all these realms of society that helps bringing about the reproducing of social relations. Communication and the production and sharing of knowledge are based on dialectics. Subject versus object, individuals so versus social groups, etc. Precisely dialectics because these theories are based on Hegelian thought. Critical theories paradigm helps us understand how communication is used to oppress and provides ways to foster positive social change. Critical theories challenge the status quo of communication contexts, looking for alternatives to those forms of oppressive communication. Critical theories offer frameworks for an analyzing the complexities and contradictions of marginalization and resistance in societies. These theories differ from other theoretical approaches because they seek praxis as the overarching goal. What does practices mean? It is the combination of theory and action. Rather than simply seeking to understand power structures, critical theories actively seek to change them. Critical theories approaches include postmodernism, which is another major product of critical theory. It analyzes the fragmentation of cultural identities in order to challenge modernist era constructs. Examples of this would be audience theories like the reception theory and race theory like Orientalism. There's also other theories, including feminist theory, political economy, and the public sphere. These critical theories expose and challenge the communication of dominant social, economic, and political structures. Areas of inquiry include language, social relationships, organizational structures, politics, economics, media, cultural ideologies, interpersonal relationships, labor, and other social movements. Let us first look at the public sphere theory developed by German social theorist Jürgen Habermas in his seminal study, The Structural Transformation of the Public Sphere, published in Germany in 1962 which conceptualized the public sphere as a sort of space that mediates between social society and the state. He defines public sphere as the social space 
in which different opinions are expressed, problems of general concern are discussed, and collective solutions are developed communicatively. It is also considered the central arena for societal communication. In large-scale societies, mass media, and more recently, online network media support and sustain communication in the public sphere. The English term public sphere is a translation of the German Offenlichkeit. The term translates into two related terms, the public or the collective of speakers and listeners present in the public sphere and the publicness or the state of being publicly visible and subject to scrutiny by the public. Habermas understands the public sphere as a space constituted by an active citizenry who gather independently of the state to engage in critical discursive relations both with the state and among themselves. It is a historically situated phenomenon and as such, its identity has evolved historically. Habermas dates the formation of the terms of public sphere and public opinion back to the 18th century, before the rise of the bourgeois or the middle class and the creation of the bourgeois public spheres, the understanding of the term public was quite different. Before that time, the representation of authority through a lord was considered public. When we talk about this, we're talking about representation as in parliament, the house of lords or congress. This conceptual model of the public sphere theory illustrates the quality of being public. This quality corresponds to a relationship between society as individuals or groups versus the state. Habermas also explains that public opinion in terms of its very idea can be formed only if a public engages in rational discussion further specifying particular characteristics of what is public. He said that in the 19th century, private individuals and groups engaged the public sphere through the media. So, to the public sphere as a sphere mediating between state and society, a sphere is which the public as a vehicle of public opinion is formed, there corresponds the principle of publicness. What are the implications of the public sphere theory in today's communication paradigm? Habermas also puts forward the argument about the alleged demise of the public sphere from the level of critical discourse in the 19th century to merely affirmative publicity in the 20th century. Instead of being a venue for intellectual discourse, it has become a marketplace of ideas where we are not engaged to think for ourselves, where instead we are encouraged to buy into an idea. Worse, in the 21st century, we have the problem of social media manipulators, such as fake news production, disinformation, the cancel culture, meme, meme warriors and troll farms that further distorts genuine discourse. Let us now discuss reception theory. The British sociologist and cultural theorist Stuart Hall was one of the main proponents of reception theory, first developed in his 1973 essay, Encoding and Decoding in the Television Discourse. Reception theory states, that media texts are encoded by the producer, they are loaded with values and messages. However, the text is then decoded by the individual in the audience, and different viewers or readers will decode the text in different ways, perhaps not in the same way the writer or producer intended. For example, his approach called for the encoding and decoding model of communication. According to Hall, audience members adopt one of the following three positions 
when they decode the text. The dominant or preferred reading would be how the producer wants the audience to view the media text. The negotiated reading is a compromise between the dominant and oppositional readings where the audience accepts parts of the producer's view but has their own view on the parts as well. Oppositional reading is when the audience rejects the preferred reading and creates their own meaning for the text. So in this example, we show, let's say the media message is a book on the traveling cat chronicles where they fictionalize and person personify the cat and his adventures. Cat lovers or the dominant um, reader would probably enjoy the book. The negotiated audience would probably wonder why a cat, why not a dog, why not a bird? While the oppositional audience would say, what nonsense is this? According to the reception theory, the decoding of the audience is affected by external or cultural factors and can determine whether they take the dominant, oppositional, or negotiated view. Some factors that affect the audience reception are life experiences, the mood at the time of viewing, one's age, one's cultural beliefs, and one's gender. Let's look at this example of a decoding of the BTS song, Idol. Artist, idol, I don't care. RM is saying that he doesn't give a shit about what people call him by anymore. But one thing to notice is, when he's saying 아니면 또 다른 뭐라 해도, he comically dances to Sai's new face choreography. So apparently, he doesn't care how many new faces he has. In the latter part of the MV, look at what the choreography looks like. You saw it, right? But let's try to chop this lyric into a different way again. Let's stop the lyrics at I don't, without the care. Not only does it sound exactly like idol, but I had no idol, connecting it with the second line that comes before it, it becomes like this. So if you try to chop the lyrics in that way, it would have the meaning of, whatever you choose to call me, aren't you going to call me an idol again? This is called a tapjongno situation in Korean, which means you've already set your own answer inside your head anyways. So as you might know, in Korea, hip-hop artists or singers that are in idol groups are not taken seriously and they're actually looked down upon. While RM said that he doesn't care about what other people call him anymore, at the same time he's trying to criticize these people that call them this and that or maybe labeling them as idols. These lyrics are pretty self-explanatory. J-Hope is proud of whatever he is, and most importantly, he's free. He has no irony anymore of who he is because he's always just himself. But one thing we should focus here are the artifacts that have been sitting on the table since the beginning of the MV. On the table, we see two things, a sailor ship and a globe. And now, there's an airplane in the background. As J-Hope addresses in his song Airplane 2, the airplane, globe, and ship all represent their current status, the freedom they have now, and pride for global success slash influence. Yes. K-pop band. I've never, I've never seen a K-pop song. Really? Yeah, no, never. Ever? Ever? Ever. The band is called BTS. BTS, yes. I've heard of BTS. Okay. That yeah. on it. This is so funny. It's like the beginning of Lion King, isn't it? Oh, yeah. As of any, uh... Very good. Mm. Okay, colonnades in the background. They're obviously good dancers. Very good dancers. Artists. You can call me, okay? What is the giraffes about? Look at that. No man of reason blaming me. This is so hard to just keep what is so much going on.
So. <laughs> There's like static in my head. <laughs> 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 it is so much going on. It's interesting how they're giving a kind of a, a commentary on how people speak to them. Mm. You know, I think the line is, you call me artist, artist you, call you call me, me idol. idol. So it's kind of interesting that they're not saying, I'm an idol, worship me. They're kind of saying, you call me this, you call me this. And then they said, I'm free. Every time they move anywhere, yeah. they must get swamped. Yeah, it'd yeah, be yeah. a really hard life. So they kind of like trying to maybe still own some of their own identity. And maybe the only way they can do that really is through their music if they have some freedom within. It's a big hit. I appreciate them for not shying away from some of the harder topics when it comes to K-pop. Because they have succeeded in bringing the gravity of the situation, just the heavier themes, um, and combining it with the video and the music in a way that's more satisfying in the past. With this song, it's the anthemic qualities. I just find the song less attractive because it's like they know they have an American audience that might not have seen some of their older stuff, and they might have only known them post Grammys or post DNA. So they have to cater towards them as well. And while the video I've, is very sort of like weird Asian YouTube style, <laughs> it doesn't really fit with the themes of the song. Yeah, one moment I did like was when you see them doing the dance on that little CGI stage and then you see like the bigger versions of them in the back. I think it's like a, a puppeteering type of theme going on. And I thought that was really cool. But all in all, it just felt like the visuals distracted from the music because it was just like, let's throw some stuff in. From the videos, we learned that the Korean understanding the language has a better grasp of what they want to say. Although perhaps we cannot really conclude that his um, while he has, he is probably part of the dominant audience, that he is not 100% accurate. On the other hand, it is the first time for the British viewer to be exposed to BTS. And therefore, his impressions are only quite uh, perhaps literal and perhaps something that he also has uh, developed or an idea that he, he perceives based on his own experience of talking with young people. Now let's go to race theories in relation to communication. It is based on the idea or the concept of othering. Othering refers to the process by which societies and groups exclude those whom they want to subordinate. Othering creates contrasting differences that involves producing narratives and images about a group of people that demonize or dehumanizes them. It provides the justification to treat these others as inferior. Some theories under this umbrella would be critical race theory and orientalism. Critical race theorists deter define racism as a firmly entrenched structure that systematically benefits whites at the expense of people of color. In communication, CRT theorists argue that speech or media messages can cause racism and that solutions to problems resulting from racism require the use of language to reshape reality. As a theoretical perspective, critical race theories consider the ideological construction of race from broader perspectives of history, culture, social and power relations, and group and self-interests. Orientalism, on the other hand, is defined as the acceptance of the West of the basic distinction between East and West at the starting point for elaborate theories, epics, novels, social descriptions, and political accounts of concerning the Orient, its peoples, its customs, its mindset, its destiny, and so on. The problem with um, Orientalism is that 
the view of the West or the judgment of the West is based on their own culture and rather than putting themselves in the shoes of the people of the Orient. Or in other words, another form of othering. That concludes our brief discussion on critical media theories.